Can business save the world? I've pondered this question for years and find that it always has remained core to a company's purpose. Against a backdrop of international terror, teetering economies, a compromised climate, and a crisis in meaning, I witness every day how business is coming to the rescue. As the chief executive officer and founder of the world's first purpose consultancy, Bright House, I help companies find their purpose, discover their purpose, articulate their purpose, and activate their purpose, all in service of making the world a better place. The story of purpose is the story of business. Business focused not just on the bottom line, but the front line of the world where there's inequality, injustice, inhumanity. Business can be a healer, not just a seller or a marketer. And today, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the story of purpose. Your story, a story that looks at business as a, as a, as a sector that focuses on the business of life, not just the life of business. Now, all stories have four parts. There's once upon a time, then suddenly something horrible happens. Luckily, someone comes to the rescue, and then we live happily ever after. Um, that's the story. And this story is no different, the story of business, because once upon a time, business was a remarkable motivator, a remarkable arena of possibility. Business actually was created to help people. We put roads in place, municipalities. We help people uh, become uh, better people, more mobile people. Uh, we gave people the opportunity to eat better, to sleep better. Uh, business was there to care for people. We had a deep knowledge of people and a deep knowledge of what they wanted. Now, around the Industrial Revolution in the United States, we had this thing called a locomotive. It was a steam engine. I would argue it was a locomotive, as in sort of a crazy idea, because at first it seemed like really cool, but the idea of extracting everything out of the earth and everything out of our hearts in service of just making money and not making meaning, that was a bad strategy. So let's flip ahead a little. Let's take the train of progress and see what happened. After 200 years of us filling our coffers, filling our pockets, but forgetting about filling our hearts and making people happier and healthier, focusing on their success rather than their happiness, focused on money rather than meaning, well, here's where business ended up. It ended up in a suddenly place because right now, in today's market, in today's world, we are faced with unprecedented terror. People drawing their swords on behalf of their lords. We have economies that are crashing. And we have a climate that is being compromised. But the biggest problem of all, I'd say, is a crisis in meaning. A crisis in meaning. Why are we here? This is the question that business is now asking. And it is the responsibility of business to engage people in something greater. The responsibility of business to focus on the business of life and make life brighter and bigger for people. Taking care of business today means taking care of others. Expanding our orbit of meaning to include others. This is the suddenly we're in. And business is now part of every human sector, part of every human endeavor on the planet. Every human endeavor on the planet. So we have incredible power. In this audience, you have the power not just to market, not just to sell, but to heal. To heal the world. To heal the injustices. Many companies are doing this. American Standard is doing this. Procter & Gamble Company is doing this. Coca-Cola Company is doing this. Now, I want to ask everybody in this audience to be part of the luckily. I want you to be the luckily. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do it the same way that Aristotle told us to do it back in 6 BC. He said, where our gifts, our unique talents, and the needs of the world intersect. There lies our vocare, Latin for calling. 
How will your business love the world? What is your business called to do? What is your personal calling? Mahatma Gandhi's calling, as he wrote it down, was to wipe every tear from every eye. What is the purpose statement of your organization? How will you drive the world? Nietzsche, the great philosopher, said, if we have a why, we can deal with any what and any where and any who. Great advice for today. We can deal with any economy. We can deal with any competitor. Uh, we can deal uh, with any oncoming tragedy if we have a why. Because a why not only bolsters us, it buffets us against what might happen and allows us to dream of what could happen. Now, there are other people who have, who have taken the path of purpose, uh, besides Nietzsche and Aristotle. Uh, Walt Disney, all of you know who Walt Disney is. If he were here today, he would say that he was never in the animation business, not the cartoon business. He was in the animating business. He animated people. He wanted to, um, he wanted to inspire their souls and have them believe in something impossible, like magic. He accomplished that. Disney was not just a business that had a bottom line. It was a business that at the heart of that business, a man led that business with heart. And that's really what purpose is. It's really moving from the path of the mind to the path of the heart. And when you do that, you get leaders, even leaders of countries, leaders of corporations. Akio Morita, the founder of Sony, an incredible story. War-torn Japan, leveled. Marita's people come to him and they say, we have a great idea for a company named, or we want to name, Sony. We're going to be the number one technology company in Japan, they said to Akio. And Marita said, you know what? That's a nice goal, but I've got a bigger purpose. How about if Japan becomes the number one country in technology throughout the world? This was a greater purpose to enliven the country, to heal the country. I've seen it in my own country. John F. Kennedy, from his pulpit at Rice University in 1961, announces to the world that we're going to put a man on the moon. Now, let me get this straight. A man on the moon, 1961. We don't even have the medals to make the capsule. NASA can't even make coffee. We're facing a war in Vietnam. Our economy is in the hopper. We've got something called civil rights issues. Why in the world would the President of the United States be talking about putting a man on the moon when everything on Earth was just falling apart? Answer, the story of purpose. He knew, he knew that if he created a story that was much bigger than our country, that he might just mobilize and galvanize our country. So he said, let's put a man on the moon. And guess what happened? Our country mobilized and galvanized around something that was impossible, making it now improbable and then possible. In 1969, it was accomplished. More importantly, a framework was set in place, the framework of purpose, the framework that says, if I go back to my beginnings, my ethos, and in the United States uh, situation, the ethos uh, was going west. If I go back to that notion of expansion, and I reframe it, taking a timeless truth of going west and creating a timely act going north to the stars, well, that just might resonate. I like to say the fruits are in the roots, and that's exactly what happens with purpose. You start with your ethos. The ethos creates culture. The culture stays together by the values that hold it together. And that black box of strategy, ethos, culture, and values, actually drives strategy and tactics. That's the framework of purpose. And that's the exciting part of being part of the luckily. And then there's happily ever after, which is where my story comes to an end and where your story begins. Because from this day forward, it can't just be about what I do and my point of difference. It has to be why I'm doing it and my point of view. It can't just be about employees. It has to be about missionaries. You don't have just contracts, purchase orders with your customers. You have covenants. And this is not just about the next quarter anymore. It's about the next quarter century. That's the stereoscopic view of leadership, keeping one eye on the next quarter and the other eye on the next quarter century. 
This is no longer just about loyalty. It's about love. And how do you get love? By being passionate about your brand, by creating a dialogue between your suppliers, your partners, your customers, and your brand. But most importantly, by doing it every single day. Passion, dialogue, and constancy, the three tenets of love. And they have correlates in business to be passionate, to always have a dialogue, and to do it every day. You know, positive virtue without <laughs> action is totally meaningless. We must take action. So it's not just about the ads. It's how our actions are adding to the world. This is not about corporate social responsibility either. This is about corporate social opportunity. The opportunity to move from Fortune 500 companies to fortunate 500 companies. Fortunate enough to help our neighbors and to heal this hurting world. So take, uh, take this notion of purpose. This idea of a greater flag, a totem, a beacon. Call it whatever you'd like. But know that the higher your purpose, the higher the profit. The metrics say so. Companies with purpose actually do better than companies without. They have more engaged workforce that looks more like a, a life force. And their numbers, their bottom line, have dramatic revenues. But most importantly, most importantly, at the heart of the story of purpose is that story of heart. And when you talk to people from the heart, those words find, find a place in people's hearts, as I hope today did for you.